Hello, it is now 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You have joined the How Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic Support People in the Criminal Justice Webinar. To allow for additional signees past the hour, we will start the webinar in a few minutes. Good afternoon, I'm Demetrius Thomas, Deputy Program Director at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Thank you for joining today's House Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, CCBHC Support People in the Criminal Justice System webinar. Today's webinar is funded by the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance, BJA, and is done in collaboration with the National Council for, well, for Mental Wellbeing, the National Council and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. To give you an overview of today's webinar, first, I will introduce the speakers, then there will be a brief overview on the Bureau of Justice Assistance, BJA, and the Council of State Government CSG Justice Center. After that, there will be a brief overview on SAMHSA and CCBHCs. There will then be a brief overview on the National Council and presentation on CCBHCs and public safety. This will be followed by a panelist Q&A with representatives for the Grand Lake Mental Health Center, a CCBHC site in Oklahoma. Immediate to follow is a panelist Q&A where you will be able to pose questions to the panelists regarding their program. There will then be a presentation on CCBHCs requirements and funding slash sustainability. Then finally, there will be a larger Q&A where you can ask follow-up questions to the panelists as well as representatives for the National Council and SAMHSA, followed by a quick closeout. Anytime during the webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. This includes both technical and content-related questions. We will try to reply to technical questions in the chat window as we go. For the content related questions, we will keep a running list and address them at the appropriate Q&A discussion in the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues that may not be able to be resolved. We are recording the webinar and will post it on our website, website by the end of next week. Brett Backerson is Director of Public Policy and Advocacy in the Policy Department at the National Council for Mental Wellbeing and leads statewide partnerships to ensure a coordinated effort for systemic transformation for the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic's CCBHC model. 
Brett previously worked at the Pew Charitable Trust, providing strategic guidance to elected and appointed leaders on the opioid crisis, suicide prevention, and care delivery for persons just as involved. Brett's clinical experience is entirely with persons just involved within jails and prisons, as well as survivors of LGBTQ plus related hate crimes. He began his policy career providing technical assistance on statewide school bullying policies, including LGBT, LGBTQ plus youth as an advisor with the state of Michigan Surgeon General on access to school based mental health services. Brett holds a master's degree in social work and a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. David Duvosny, director of the um, within the Division of Services and Systems Improvement Center for Mental Health Services at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and works has included research, implementation, evaluation, and policy development related to support related to supports for adults in, with serious mental illness, primary and behavioral health care integration, child and youth services, criminal justice, and other topics related to mental health and substance use disorders. Prior to serving his current position, David worked as a consultant with the Technical Assistance Center, supporting multiple states to improve their behavioral health systems through Medicaid innovation and development. Over the past decade and a half, David has worked as a branch chief policy analyst and government project officer within SAMHSA and as a policy analyst within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the Office of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. David started his career at a community health center in rural Indiana, working with children, youth, and families and, and a group home, serving youth just as involved in Central Virginia. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Earlham College and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Michigan. I am Demetrius Thomas, Deputy Program Director within the Behavioral Health Division at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. In this role, I oversee the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Technical and Training Assistant grantees. Prior to joining the Justice Center, I worked at the, at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where I led the agency's work at the intersection of criminal justice and mental and behavioral health, including establishing the city's first ever diversion centers, co response, and mobile crisis teams. Next, I'll provide an overview on the mission of the BJA and CSG Justice Center. BJA's mission is to help to make communities safer by strengthening the nation's criminal justice system. Its grants, training, and technical assistance and policy development services provide state and local and state and local indigenous nations with the cutting edge tools and best practices they need to reduce violence and drug related crime, support law enforcement, and combat victimization. Now I am going to give some background on the Council of State State Governments Justice Center. The Justice Center is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership association representing state officials in all three branches of government with the expertise of policy and research team focused on assisting others to attain measurable results. Our staff develops research driven strategies to increase public safety and, and strengthen communities. This, this slide describes a bit more about our work style and how we strive to reflect Justice Center core values, which include a commitment to being independent and non nonpartisan in every aspect of our work, providing vigorous, trusted, high quality analysis, developing practical and innovative solutions informed by data and research, promoting collaboration and building consensus, and building inclusive and respectful and being inclusive and respectful of diverse views and experiences. Our goal is to break the cycle of incarceration, improve health, opportunity and equity, and explain what works to improve safety. I, I will discuss this a bit more in detail, but I just want to flag our upcoming national conference taking the call which will explore innovative community resp responder models. This event is free and open to the public and will be held on October 20th to the 21st 
2021 between 11.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. More on taking the call later. Thanks again, everyone, for joining the webinar. I'll be back later. Now I'm going to turn it over to David, who will provide an overview of SAMHSA and CCBHC and, and CCBHCs generally. And thank you for all of your work uh, on the, in the Justice Center. I know you'll do a great job. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So today I'm just going to talk briefly at the beginning and tell you a little bit about SAMHSA, uh, talk a little bit about how CCBHCs were developed over the years, <laughs> talk somewhat about the uh, certification criteria and what really makes a CCBHC, uh, discuss the required services under CCBHCs, and talk a little bit about the geographic spread um, of CCBHCs. But first, I really want to thank all of you for your work. It's vitally important, um, you know, working at the nexus of the criminal justice system and the behavioral health system. There's so much need there. You know, these are really vulnerable folks who are coming to contact with both of our systems. And, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to, I think, serve the cause of justice to improve the lives of, of really vulnerable individuals. And then also to better use the resources that have been entrusted to us by the public. And so, to everybody here attending today on the webinar, just a uh, thank you from me. And I, I know that that is a sentiment that's, that's echoed by a lot of other folks at SAMHSA. So thanks to all of you. So we're going to talk about certified community behavioral health clinics today. And um, so why are we talking about CCBHCs? You know, as many of you know, the, the behavioral health system in our country has been fragmented and under-resourced for, for, for quite a long time. And there's been heroic efforts by people on the ground um, for decades, really, to, to, to cope with that and to serve people in the way that they can best uh, reach their needs. But CCBHCs, I think, are a unique opportunity to address many of the fundamental problems faced by our field. They bring together a comprehensive range of services, incorporating evidence-based practices um, and, uh, and staffing based on um, the needs uh, of the community they serve based on a formal needs assessment process. CCBHCs provide a minimum standard for access to mental health and substance use disorder services, uh, including the increased ability to respond to crises which is really important in the criminal justice field. And then under the Medicaid demonstration, uh, there's two parts of the CCBHC program, which I'll talk about in a second. Under the me Medicaid demonstration through a prospective payment system that reimburses providers at cost, there's a whole lot of flexibility within the CCBHC, mo CCBHC model to pursue innovation, to further develop the workforce, and to create a, a sustainable funding stream for quality care. And so, you know, there's just a, a lot of potential under this model. So I think it's a great opportunity to tell you a little bit about it. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about SAMHSA or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We're an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level, and we lead public health efforts related to advancing the behavioral health of the nation and uh, helping people with uh, mental and substance use disorders and their families. Our vision is really to provide resources through our policies, through our grant programs, um, and through information, data, um, and uh, all our other resources to advance um, the service system in our country in the realms of prevention, treatment, and recovery services. And our mission is, of course, to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental illness on America's communities. Uh, we are composed of a number of programmatic centers, the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, and the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. I work in the Center for Mental Health Services, um, but we work closely with our partners to ensure that, that uh, we can do everything we can to build a comprehensive set of services to serve people with mental and substance use disorders across the country. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to tell you a little bit about the background of, of CCBHCs and, and how they came, became to be. So in 2014, Congress passed the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014, and that included Section 223, which really spawned the whole Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic program. Um, it charged the Department of Health and Human Services with developing certification criteria for CCBHCs. Um, and it charged us also with developing the prospective payment system that I mentioned earlier under Medicaid that would reimburse clinics based on their costs for the services they provide. And, uh, um, and so HHS moved forward with that work and published um, a funding opportunity announcement for state planning grants, um, certification criteria that really lay out what it is to be a CCBHC as well as guidance on that prospective payment system in 2015. Uh, later that year, Sam, the HHS awarded planning grants to 24 states to plan around what uh, developing a CCBHC program, and in 2016 awarded eight demonstration states to participate in the Medicaid CCBHC demonstration. 
There was an initial demonstration period that's span from 2017 to 2019. Um, and uh, that demonstration was extended. It has been extended several times um, uh, now to uh, September 30th, 2023. Um, in addition, uh, very recently, two additional states have been added to the demonstration. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so the demonstration has grown a little bit in terms of the states that are participating. There's also been a, an evaluation that's been looking at the demonstration from the beginning, and it's also extended recently uh, to uh, cover the full demonstration period. In addition to the Medicaid demonstration, um, which funds uh, CCVHCs through a prospective payment system that I've already mentioned, there's also a SAMHSA expansion grant program. Um, that was launched in 2018, uh, and that program seeks to, to rec replicate the CCBHC model uh, using SAMHSA grant funding. So SAMHSA grantees in the CCBHC expansion grant program, as it's known, receive $2 million each year for two years um, to pursue the CCBHC model and fulfill the certification criteria. We ordered our first uh, cohort of 50, uh, 52 grants in 2018, um, and this August, we'll be awarding our fifth cohort, and we'll be up to 400 CCBHC expansion grants. So it's, it's clear that this is really spread quite widely across the country at this point. Um, we're also anticipating the award of a CCBHC expansion grant technical assistance center uh, later this year, and I think that'll be a great support to the field as well. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about the differences between the expansion grants. Uh, and the, the Medicaid demonstration. So the big difference is the expansion grants uh, provide um, uh, uh, that extra funding to help uh, uh, community mental health centers or other providers fill in their service array so they can become a CCBHC. Um, whereas that prospective payment system provides you know, really comprehensive funding based on that center's cost to ensure that they um, become a CCBHC. Also, there's quite a bit of state infrastructure within the Medicaid demonstration um, around support of the CCBHCs, a certification process run by the state in the demonstration states that isn't uh, in place for the SAMHSA expansion grants. Uh, although we do have a separate attestation process that SAMHSA operates. So there, there are some important differences between the expansion grants and the Medicaid demonstration, um, but all in service is the same plan, which is to create these really comprehensive evidence-based community clinics um, that can meet the needs of people across the population in terms of mental health and substance use. So, uh, the next slide, please. So what do CCBHCs actually do? What they do is meet these sort of certification criteria. And this slide is, is really distilling it down to as simple as, as possible. There's a 76 page document online on SAMHSA's webpage, which really lays the full uh, spectrum of services or requirements around CCBHCs out. And I think it's, if you're really interested in the model, that's the best place to go to understand what a CCBHC is. So there's requirements around six main areas. First, uh, CCBHCs have to have adequate staffing, and that's based on the local needs assessment that I, I mentioned earlier. They have to meet state licensing requirements, and they have to provide training to support service delivery uh, according to what's found in their needs assessment. They have to uh, provide available and accessible services. Um, there's sort of standards and the timeliness of access to care um, uh, and uh, when a treatment plan is developed uh, and when that treatment plan is removed. And importantly, there's even more stringent standards for when a person in crisis needs to get care. Um, that they should get crisis almost immediately and that crisis uh, support be available 24 seven. So if someone's experiencing a uh, crisis in a community with a CCBHC, they should be able to get that support. Uh, CCBHCs are also responsible for providing care coordination across a variety of services and providers. Um, uh, and uh, they really are supposed to take accountability for the care of individuals they serve. Um, uh, there's also requirements around their use of health information technology and, and other infrastructure to support that care coordination role. CCBHCs are required to provide nine uh, required services, um, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit on the next slide. Uh, CCBHCs in the Medicaid demonstration are required to report on 21 quality measures and to build a quality measurement infrastructure to improve their programs. Um, I'm going to, uh, so the requirements are not uh, as stringent in the expansion grant program, um, uh, but this is a really important aspect of CCBHCs, especially in our, our modern healthcare system. Finally, there are requirements around organizational authority and governance for CCBHCs. Um, so there's requirements that there be consumer representation in the governance of organizations that become CCBHCs, as well as making sure that they meet appropriate state accreditation requirements. So again, that's really just a nutshell of what the full requirements are, but it gives you a sense of the kinds of things that CCBHCs are responsible for. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a map of the required services that CCBHCs are required to provide. 
Uh, and so uh, in this century, you'll see four uh, services that CCBHCs are required to provide directly. And those are treatment planning, screening assessment, diagnosis, and risk assessment, outpatient mental health and substance abuse, uh, sorry, use services, and then crisis services. Um, uh, the one exception there is that for crisis services, if there is an established crisis service network uh, in the area the CCBHC serves, then they can um, develop something called a direct collaborating organization relationship with that uh, existing crisis service to make sure that people are getting the crisis care that they need. So those services must be provided directly by the CCBHC. Uh, there are five additional services that CCBHCs are required to provide, but they can choose to provide them directly or provide them through a, uh, that direct designated collaborating organization relationship. Uh, and those other services that the CCBHC has to make sure that people have access to through the CCBHC, uh, even if it's under contract in these formal relationships, are targeted case management, outpatient uh, primary care screening and monitoring, community-based mental health care for veterans, peer family support and counselor services, and then psychiatric rehabilitation services. And anything that, that folks need uh, that CCBHCs aren't able to provide, they really are supposed to have uh, the referral network to get people connected to the appropriate supports. Next slide, please. So where are CCBHCs? So first I'm gonna talk about the Medicaid demonstration. So the original eight states in the Medicaid demonstration had 66 clinics in them, and you can see the eight states here, Minnesota, Missouri, Nevada, New Jersey, uh, New York, Oklahoma, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania did leave the federal demonstration at the end of 2019, but uh, two more states have been added to the, the Medicaid demonstration. Uh, and uh, Michigan and Kentucky should be starting um, uh, their CCBHC demonstration um, participation uh, in the next few months. And uh, um, so we're looking forward to them uh, joining the demonstration, uh, bringing us up to, to nine states in total in the, in the Medicaid demonstration. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here you can see the spread of our CCBHC expansion grants across the country. So we're in almost all states at this point. And, and apologies to the folks in Alabama. Someone caught this right before the call uh, today. Um, uh, Alabama does have two of these clinics um, uh, funded. And so uh, no slight meant to Alabama there. We're very excited about their work and working with them. Uh, but uh, as you can see, there really are across the country point. This, this model has really been disseminated quite widely. So. We're looking forward to seeing uh, you know, how that takes off across the country and then also seeing how we can work across the country to support what I think is a very promising model. So that is my very quick <laughs> overview of the CCCB, CCBHC program. There's a lot more to hear today. I just wanna say really uh, at the nexus of criminal justice and uh, mental health CCBHCs have a really promising role. One of the very exciting findings we had from that national evaluation that I mentioned was that about one third of CCBHCs are actually providing services within jails and prisons, which I, I think is or, or around the transitions from jails and prisons into the community. And I think that's a really promising uh, thing to see. Another is to see um, that CCBHCs are able to provide a variety of innovative practices that they might not be able to through their normal billing procedures. Um, and so one example, and I think we're gonna hear about this later, is uh, folks in Oklahoma are able to pay for through their CCBHCs uh, iPads that law enforcement officers are able to take out uh, with them into community to bring in crisis, crisis counselors whenever they need them. Um, you know, there's there's just a lot of potential for innovation under the CCBHC model. Um, so uh, yes, uh, you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, in a little bit. So um, thanks to everybody, and I think uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to turn things over now to um, Brett Beckerson with the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, and he's going to tell you a little bit more. Great, thank you uh, so much, David. Um, hi everyone, my name is Brett Beckerson. Uh, as Demetri said. Uh, I direct policy and advocacy for the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. Um, you may previously know us as the National Council for Behavioral Health. Um, we have since rebranded and look to embrace really what we seek to achieve and not how the symptoms of mental, of mental illness or substance use disorders manifest uh, in those behavioral conditions. So I'll start talking about CCBHCs and I'll share some data and I'll share some information from both research that we've done uh, around the intersection of CCBHCs and justice systems um, that we've taken from some of our federal partners that, uh, that they've been able to do, and then also kind of looking at some data that states have shared as well. Um, to echo a little bit about what uh, David just shared, you know, the CCBHC model really does look to kind of raise the bar um, with what we're able to see um, in some of the service delivery areas for, uh, for, for clinics providing services for people with mental health and substance use conditions. Um, and they do that by increasing or expanding the evidence-based practices that they're providing. Um, and that's not just within the four walls of the clinic, 
but that's in the community as well. So they can kind of break out of those four walls. And that's really where we see a lot of these partnerships happen within the community, not just with um, our justice partners, but also with schools, housing, et cetera. Um, there's that quality reporting element that David talked about, and that's all supported by this prospective payment system as well. When we talk about this work, I often get this question of like, well, why haven't I heard about this model before? You know, where's um, this, this is making such huge impacts. It's doing such great work. You know, really where, um, what, how do I find out more information? Um, and I'll tell you a, a, a little bit my own perspective is that um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, really uh, overshadowed a lot of the data that came out right in the beginning of 2020 um, around the impacts and uh, the effects and the innovations that the CCBHC model was really providing. Um, we did a research effort um, earlier this year, um, and at that time, um, there were 229 clinics in 33 states. So we were able to survey about 70% of those or so uh, and get some innovative data to see what they were doing, and I'll be able to share those here. Um, so before I share those, I want to just give kind of two quick states. So Missouri, which uh, David talked about as a demonstration site, and Texas, which really kind of took the reins and um, built this model independently. Um, Missouri's been able to see hospitalizations drop about 20%. Um, overall behavioral health services increased across the state 23% in three years. Um, veteran services, which is a specific area of focus, also increased 19%. Um, within one year, they saw a 20% decrease for folks with, with physical health conditions, right? And we know for, as, for folks who kind of work um, with individuals with substance use or, or mental health conditions or both, that those co-occurring physical health conditions um, you know, are, are often present. So seeing some significant decrease for uh, hypertension and diabetes. And then here's one that I think is really powerful um, is that justice involvement for individuals with behavioral health uh, conditions decreased by 55% within one year. Um, so that's pretty uh, impressive looking at this statewide. Um, within Texas, um, part, of part of their CCBHC model is the larger healthcare system. Um, and the innovations there, they were able to project a $10 billion savings by 2023 um, uh, if their uh, 1115 waiver gets approved. Um, within two years, they were able to see zero wait lists uh, within, C within CCBHCs. So really important data point, really important element, right, when we're thinking about ushering or they're either deflecting or diverting people to care, um, connecting folks to care via our court systems or otherwise. Uh, so it was pretty important. And then the folks who have co-occurring substance use and uh, mental health conditions um, are more often seen at CCBHCs uh, compared to non-CCBHC clinics in Texas. So again, um, a place where it is a one-stop shop for whole person care. Um, and these are just two examples from different states. Um, we released a, uh, a impact survey and it has a lot of really great information when we were able to survey both those demonstration sites as well as those grantees, um, as David talked about earlier. Um, some great data to show that across the board, um, uh, access to care increased about 17%. Um, CCBHCs, 70% uh, of them are offering two forms of, of medication-assisted treatment, which is the gold standard for opioid use disorder. So as we're responding to the opioid crisis, as we're responding to the overdose crisis, ensuring access to more of those uh, medications is going to be key uh, to connecting folks to care and making sure we can prevent uh, overdose and, and prevent relapse. Um, 50% uh, were providing same day access and almost all about 85%, 84% were able to see patients within a week. Um, we're seeing a lot of coordination with our emergency departments um, and 95% of them have engaged in innovative practices with their law enforcement partners. So on that law enforcement element, here are some kind of uh, data that I think uh, just show the level of connection that CCBHCs have with their justice systems partners. So. Uh, when it comes to specialty courts, so you know, courts that be drug courts, veterans courts, mental health courts broadly, um, we see about 76% um, have those partnerships uh, in place. Um, able, the ability for the CCBT to provide, and often that is being provided at no charge to those uh, uh, within the correctional office or within uh, law enforcement on the ground, trainings in mental health first aid, crisis intervention trainings, and other trainings that help to uh, raise awareness and destigmatize substance use conditions. Um, increasing access um, for services writ large, um, when we're thinking about um, connecting folks from the criminal legal system and having those outreach programs, we think about like ACT programs or AOT. 
um, pre-release as well. And one thing I think is really important, which is you know an area that I'm personally invested in in in, uh, in, in shaping and in increasing, is that sh is that data sharing. Um, we see so often that what the justice systems may see and what the healthcare systems may see could could be could be different, either slightly or completely. And so, how do we kind of have those data sharing mechanisms? so that we have a really good understanding of what the disease burden is within our communities, and therefore we can attack that appropriately. Um, when it comes to crisis services, and I know that um, uh, our, our friends at Grand Lake will talk about this as well, um, but 100% of CCBHCs offer crisis services. It's a required part of the scope of service, um, but about 51% of them in, created those crisis services programs um, because they became a CCBHC. There's a number of innovative practices here and a lot of data that I could kind of walk through. Um, but there's a, there are programs like the CAHOOTS model, looking at co-responder models, um, being able to embed clinicians within different types of justice spaces um, as well, and having that be compensated by the CCBHC um, where, where allowable, um, being able to deflect some costs um, in addition to making sure that we're deflecting individuals to the appropriate spaces for care and treatment. Um, I'll also mention here that in July of 2022, all states are going to be mandated to establish this 988 model, which is the 911 equivalent for substance use and mental health conditions. And because CCBHCs provide um, these crisis services and can provide that innovative uh, element to be able to adapt and mold and be nimble to their community's needs, that's going to be a key component for the for the, for that nine and eight models that that the CCBHC can be a vehicle in order to move that forward and to connect it. So um, something to think about if you are involved in crisis care and you are working on uh, nine and eight innovations uh, in your state, how those things can be connected so that we're not duplicate uh, duplicating different services. When it comes to SUD specific uh, areas, we see a lot of innovation with the CCBHC model. So 100% of CCBHCs um, have SUD specialists um, on staff and individuals who are peer supports, uh, uh, which is an individual who uh, uh, is, is, has the same or similar lived experiences uh, to someone who is currently receiving care and, and looking to seek recovery. Um, as relates to those who are justice involved, about 83% have those outreach programs um, for individuals who have substance use disorder to folks who are previously incarcerated and about 45% um, provide telehealth services. Again, you know, providing um, either the technology, the innovation, the means by which the financial supports to connect, um, particularly right when we're thinking about rural or for areas where, where transportation may be a little tricky um, to courts, police offices, and other areas for justice services. Um, for highlighted care coordination, again, within the juvenile justice system within the criminal justice system and mental health courts. These are data from ASPE as um, the different care coordination relationships that we see uh, across the board, um, particularly from those demonstration sites. And here's what we see with those kind of informal versus formal uh, relationships. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in this chart, but um, the federal policy that David mentioned, um, the, uh, the PEMA Act of 2014, it laid this foundation and it requires that CCBHCs have criminal justice partnerships. It doesn't define what those partnerships have to look like. It doesn't say they have to include um, you know, law enforcement or they have to include the courts. Um, so it leaves it up to kind of states and to the clinics, particularly those grantees, right, to be able to mold this in a way that really works well for their, uh, their system. So federal government providing the floor and then states and those clinics being able to build off of that. Um, in here, we see those formal relationships happening within different areas and then also informal relationships. So across the board, whether it exists, you know, in a more formalized kind of memorandum of understanding or some kind of financial partnership or not, um, we're going to see a lot of different partnerships across the board at a community or statewide level. Um, and for those of you who are doing this work, right, I mean, um, all of you work at this intersection of of criminal justice or broadly speaking, kind of the judicial or justice systems um, and substance use and mental health. Um, this is a key opportunity to be able to establish some partnerships um, through CCBHCs that may help to deflect the person costs or also build upon the great work that you're already doing. So within the sequential intercept model, I'll, I'll be fairly uh, quick about this. So, so this is a model that was established by Policy Research Associates, um, which is a 
just innovative think tank technical systems partner uh, that does a lot of really great work um, at the intersections that we're talking about here today. Uh, they've mapped out kind of uh, the different uh, uh, sectors or intercepts where individuals may uh, come into contact with uh, our justice systems and where there may be some points for deflection or diversion. Um, we're at, at the National Council kind of mapping out where the CCBHC uh, links with each of these intercepts um, to show the, the full innovation and the, the full areas of support for the CCBHC model within our justice systems. Um, but I'm going to just show you the, the first two intercepts and then I'll pass it off to uh, Back to Demetrius. So for intercept zero, um, uh, PRA, those policy research associates, identified three different areas. And here I've shown kind of a, an alignment where the CCBHC requirements link to those different segments of, of, of the zero intercept, um, both from, or from that 24-7, 365 crisis support, looking at connecting those warm handoffs and connecting folks within the emergency departments or other kind of urgent area, uh, care needs areas. Um, looking at police friendly crisis services, including that deflection service area. And here we have a number of different areas in which CCBHCs have provided a lot of innovation, provided a lot of support uh, for folks who may be in moments of crisis. When we look at um, our law enforcement partnerships for dispatcher training, again, the CCBHC is able to provide often at zero cost uh, to those folks within law enforcement um, trainings to support individuals in 911. They're able to house, um, in, in some cases, um, where those call centers are and have some shared staff to make sure that individuals can be more quickly connected uh, to folks who need that care. Um, and then also intervening um, where individuals may need some of that follow up in crisis care, right? So it's not just that we're deflecting an individual to a place for service, but there's that long term uh, follow up to ensure that that care can be provided. Uh, and so that's um, my segment of this about you know, our work at National Council kind of how we work um, and, and uh, provide research and support, uh, technical assistance to uh, clinics and to states. Um, I will now pass it off to Demetrius to provide introduction for um, an incredible clinic doing incredible work uh, in Oklahoma. Thank you so much, Demetrius. Thank you, Brett. Today, as Brett said, today we have the pleasure of being joined by representatives from the Grand Lake Mental Health Center GLMHC, a CCBHC in Oklahoma. Josh Cantwell serves as a Chief Operating Officer at GLH, GLMHC. During his more than a decade of service, he has held many clinical and administrative roles. He has been instrumental in the development and oversight of multiple innovative programs, including Grand Lake Mental Health Center's 24-7 treatment model. This model utilizes mobile technology and numerous levels of care to provide instant face-to-face -face access to treatment and assessment when and where it is needed. The model focuses on treating individuals in the least restrictive environment and has had produced significant outcomes related to the reduction of psychiatric hospitalizations for those living in Northeastern and North Central Oklahoma. Josh is a firm believer in the philosophy that, imp that the impossible is just the, impo just the possible that is yet to be tamed. Josh has created and published over 20 therapeutic games focusing on mental health and substance use issues. Josh holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Oklahoma. He is a licensed clinical so social worker and a certified peer recovery support specialist. Alicia Bree, Bre I'm sorry, Alicia Beard is the special programs coordinator for GLMHC and manages all programs and contracts outside of outpatient and crisis services. Alicia has been with GLMHC for 11 years and was the court coordinator for the mental health court for eight years before transitioning to her current role. She has developed and implemented programs, including pretrial release, assisted outpatient treatment, diversionary services, as well as substance use, housing, and employment services. In a minute, I will turn it over to Brad, who will lead the discussion with the panelists. Immediately after the panelists' discussion, you all will have the opportunity to ask the panelists questions about their program. As mentioned earlier, Please type all questions into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We will respond to as many questions as possible within the allotted time for this section. 
please remember that if we do not get to your question during this particular Q&A, it can be answered in the Q&A toward the end of the webinar. Brett? Sure. Well, um, I uh, am going to, because I've, I've had the, the privilege and the, the honor to hear uh, Josh and Alicia talk about their work um, at length. So I'm, I'm actually just going to pass it off to, to you both to talk about your work. Um, and then if uh, there are things that I happen to know um, from our previous discussions that may be relevant, I'll, uh, I'll kind of in interject and ask you to, to share a little bit more about it. But from my understanding, Alicia, you're going to talk first about kind of the latter half of uh, the sequential intercept model and the work you're doing there. And then we'll have Josh will talk about your uh, quote unquote bread and butter uh, in the crisis area work. That's correct. Thank you, Brett and Demetrius. My, uh, as again, as they said, my name is Alicia Beard uh, with Grand Lake. Thank you for having us. Um, I know that Josh is going to talk a lot about the uh, intercept zero and one. So I'm going to start with intercept two and the work that we've done, uh, particularly with our pretrial release program. This is currently in one of our counties um, where we receive referrals directly from the county jail, uh, depending on severity, and present uh, with the judge and the district attorney and the defense attorney. Um, a plan to keep them out of jail on a PR bond um, and complete a pretrial service at a reduced rate. So right now the jail houses them at $39 a day. And so at the rate of $19.50 a day, they come into our pretrial release program um, and are either placed in our crisis services or just our outpatient services. And we monitor their uh, compliance and success throughout that process and report that back to the court um, as they complete the process uh, to have their case uh, disposed of. And so with that, we have seen um, a success rate of about 35%. We've had a total of 23 participants uh, from December 2017 until now. Um, but the total number of jail days saved has been uh, a little over 2100 uh, days to the county jail. And so when we talk about pretrial release program, we are talking about some of the most severe uh, inmates in there experiencing a lot of uh, severe symptoms that are best treated outside of the jail system. And so while these cost savings are just the $39 a day, um, it really speaks to a lot more than that because there are a lot more resources being used. And so with that, we've saved the county as a whole over $80,000 since starting this program, which is that few amount of people. Um, from there, we have the intercept three, which is uh, we are big participants in mental health court, drug courts, community sentencing. We also complete a fender screener through our con uh, contract through the Department of Mental Health which um, is a risk needs assessment and determines whether someone is appropriate for a uh, community um, and not being not going to prison from there. And so with that offender screener, we um, see statewide averages of about 57 days um, out of jail sooner. And so we see a lot of success um, as far as placing people in uh, probation and not draining the resources of uh, being placed in prison. And so intercept four with our re-entry, uh, we collaborate a lot with our uh, community partners with probation um, and parole. And a lot of our offender screenings um, in mental health court recognize as far as those that are in re-entry and definitely try and uh, try and intervene at that point as well. And so then with intercept five with community corrections, we uh, again collaborate with those partners with probation and parole, particularly in Ottawa County, we um, are providing uh, sex offender treatment, um, which is a self pay referral from a probation officer and a judge. We also, you know, again, will provide that support um, just with the constant uh, collaborations that we do with them. I think the most important things that we see with this is just our uh, interactions with judges, with the district attorneys, with law enforcement, which includes those with the, uh, with the county jails, and just trying to make sure that all of these partners in our communities are aware of our services and are aware that 
these services will uh, not only help enhance the participants at that time, but will also um, keep them from going back into the system as a whole. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Josh to just describe the intercept zero and one. Alicia, thank you. Uh, we're so excited to share a little bit of what we're doing here in Oklahoma. So I'm Josh Cantwell, uh, Chief Operating Officer for Grand Lake Mental Health Center. I, I enjoyed uh, David and Brett's synopsis of kind of an outline of, of what CCBHCs are. And so I'm looking forward to sharing what it can look like when put into practice. So with the, with the information Alicia was giving, really our goal when it comes to those involved in the criminal justice population and how we're um, addressing the intercept model. We don't want anybody to ever move past the intercept that we find them at. So wherever we get to a situation where we're able to intervene and be involved in someone's life and treatment at a certain intercept, we don't want them to move to that next one. And so the one I'm going to talk to you about is intercept zero, where we've invested a lot of our resources and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it used to be like. I'm going to tell you what happened, and then I'm going to tell you what it's like now. And for us, you heard a lot about outcomes being important uh, when it comes to the CCBHC model in practice. And for us, that's what this is all about now. It's about achieving the health outcomes and criminal justice outcomes of the people that we're responsible for serving in our areas. So we serve a 12-county area in northeastern and north central Oklahoma. It's primarily rural. We have a population of about 490,000 individuals that live in that area, about 10,000 square miles. And we saw in 2015 that there was a, an influx in people going to the highest level of psychiatric care, uh, psychiatric hospitalization. And what that meant to us is that we were struggling with some of our partner relationships, specifically law enforcement. And we set a goal to decrease that number. So our, our outcome that we were looking for when we became a CCBHC, our first major outcome was to decrease the number of people that were going to inpatient hospitalization from our area. Well, we determined that what was happening was every one of those people that I just said, the 1,115, a very large percent of those, over 95%, that was initiated by a law enforcement contact. So that means that law enforcement officers in our area were coming upon someone in mental health crisis or, or uh, a presumed mental health crisis. And the method for treatment was to then take them to the emergency room where they would, the law enforcement officer would sit and wait for medical clearance to occur and wait for uh, an, an emergency room physician to make the determination of where that individual would go. And a lot of times based on uh, trying to make sure that they didn't make a mistake and let someone go home that was in need of a higher level of care, they often resulted in someone being uh, sent to inpatient hospitalization. At which point the law enforcement officer would then have to drive that person. And in our case, in those areas that we're talking about in Northeastern, North Central Oklahoma, sometimes that was two hours away, three hours away. So what that resulted in the whole process was taking up four hours, five hours. We have stories of multiple shifts where law enforcement officers were having to, to uh, you know, trade shifts while waiting at the emergency room prior to someone um, completing that process and going inpatient. What it also did was it sent people to the highest possible level of care where those outcomes were not necessarily the desirable outcomes. So loss of job, further uh, trauma and stress associated with their civil liberties being taken away for a certain period of time. What we decided to do with the opportunities uh, allowed by the CCBHC model is we decided to work with a, a data mining firm and a technology firm to create a custom application that we placed on iPads. And then we began placing those iPads in the hands of law enforcement officers across our service area. So we started small with one um, district at a time, one agency at a time, really the only people that would work with us at that time, because this is a pretty innovative idea. So we presented it to multiple, multiple uh, agencies and we had a couple takers. And so we started, we started the model. And what we saw was that law enforcement officers were then able to 
connect instantly 24 hours a day to a licensed mental health professional. Because at the same time that we were developing this application and putting the mobile technology in the hands of law enforcement officers, we opened a couple additional levels of care. So before there was two options. People that were in a mental health crisis could go to an inpatient hospital, highest level of care, which also means the most expensive level of care, or they could go to outpatient. They could come in and we would have to say that they were stable enough to uh, be left to their own devices uh, overnight, be okay, come into our clinic the next day. So when we were able to add those two additional levels of care, we added a structured crisis center level of care as a CCBHC, and then we added a psychiatric urgent care level of care, which gave us the opportunity to serve people on multiple levels. So people that may not quite be at that level of being uh, appropriate for psychiatric hospitalization, or people that were volunteering because they knew that they were on the verge of having a, a, a worse crisis, we were able to take them into our, into our care. And we strategically placed those units in different counties so that we had the shortest drive possible for law enforcement officers. Then what we were able to do is start getting those devices to all law enforcement officers in our service area. So as we sit today, in those 12 counties, we have 850 law enforcement officers. That's every single law enforcement officer in the service area that we serve has one of those applications, has a, has a device with that custom application. And we've locked the devices down to anything else. So when they open up, it, it turns into a mental health machine. There's, there's, there's two buttons. There used to just be one button. So I'll tell you about the other button in a minute. But the one button says crisis. <laughs> they hit the button. So now what it looks like is a law enforcement officer anywhere, anytime, because those, those units are open 24 hours a day. And so I have seven people on staff, seven licensed people on staff at every unit. So that's 20, I mean, I know you guys can do math. That's 21 individuals, 24 hours a day, able to take these calls coming in from the iPads. That means a law enforcement officer comes upon somebody at three o'clock in the morning that looks like they're possibly experiencing a mental health crisis. They don't have to, they don't have to think anything beyond. I probably need to get some assistance on this situation. They take the iPad out, they hit the button. The law enforcement officer can talk to us first. They can consult first if they want, give us some background, but they don't have to. They can hit the button and hand it to the individual. We're capable of doing real time assessment, triage, treatment, crisis de-escalation, and get that person to the most appropriate level of care immediately. Remember, we can. We can do the assessment while the law enforcement officer is on their way to our closest facility. So how this looks is the calls last about, I had somebody pull some data because I knew Brett was wanting to hear some numbers here. So uh, I had somebody pull some numbers and our average call length is eight minutes and eight seconds. So now that the conversation that we're having with an individual or with a law enforcement officer who we're, we're receiving about 400 calls per month on on these so 400 calls a month are coming in in our service area so that that's about on an average about half of the law enforcement officers every month are utilizing this opportunity that we have this this technology in their cars then they're they're getting on their way to our site and our goal is to get them out in less than seven minutes once they arrive with someone so we've already collected all the information we need and our goal is for them to drive to us our goal is to have them less than 30 minutes away too. So we're trying to strategically place these units where law enforcement officers are never driving farther than 30 minutes. And then once they get to us, they're in and out the door within seven minutes. Our numbers are less than seven minutes. We're, we're hitting six something, but that's our goal is to make sure that they're not there for less than seven minutes. So that means that we went from a situation where law enforcement officers are spending hours upon hours every time they get a call the law enforcement officers are purposefully getting the help that they need and making determination of what the best level of care is and the outcome that we were looking for. So I'm going to tell you what we did for law enforcement officers first. So this to date has saved those law enforcement officers in our 12 counties 275 days of continuous driving. It's also that that equates about 6,600 hours of staff time. So we know that hours equal dollars and we know that time equals the, them able to operate their agencies more efficiency, efficiently, 
And so now that adversarial type relationship that we dealt with has become a collaborative relationship and we're able to work together to, to further improve this process. We have also seen that inpatient hospitalizations, because remember that was a secondary benefit from what we were doing. Our goal, our outcome we were looking for was a reduction in inpatient hospitalizations. So in the last six months, zero people have gone to that highest level of care from our service area through this process. So we, we say about a 90% reduction rate overall, but that includes us expanding these services to a whole other service area during this time. So now instead of 1,115 people going to that highest level of care, we have zero people going in the last six months. We've also, through our participation uh, in the CCBHC demonstration, we knew that the goal would be to, for people never to be in contact with law enforcement in the first place, so that we were able to reach people directly when crisis or uh, potential crisis are going to occur. So we began releasing people from our units when people would come in in crisis. So a law enforcement officer would bring somebody to one of our crisis units. We would uh, we would get them stabilized and we would release them with an iPad with the same custom application. So that means that then from that point individuals, our highest need people that we're serving, have a lifeline to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where they can reach out directly by hitting that same button that says crisis and getting connected every time to a live mental health professional to de-escalate that crisis. So what that has done, intuitively, if I'm listening to this for the first time, I would think that as the inpatient hospitalizations decreased by 90%, my crisis utilization would have increased by 90% to those units that I'm saying law enforcement are bringing people to. In fact, they both dropped parallel to one another at the same time because we were preventing people from having to utilize law enforcement as a mental health lifeline from that, from that situation. Looking at my stopwatch really quick. I just did something. I set myself a timer. I want to make sure. Okay. I I think you're you're good on on time. I just I just kind of want to quickly just repeat or echo what you just what you and Alicia just said. So you are through your CCBHC um, being able to provide technology, provide staff, provide trainings, um, provide and and doing all this in in a way that and my assumption is not just connecting people to care, but also destigmatizing substance use and mental health within your communities. Um, so that you know when individuals are in moments of crisis or prior to, like as you know symptoms may develop, there's a, a greater opportunity for them to reach out and to connect to care because of those connections and innovations. Um, and all of that is being done by and large, it sounds like, you know, minus a, a, some of those partnerships that um, that where the county's involved, is being funded by the CCBHC where there is that federal Medicaid match so that the state's actually saving dollars on if it would have been a line item budget otherwise. Does that, is that kind of aligning with what you, you guys are, are sharing? Just as a quick recap. Yeah, it was perfect. Though you said it very eloquently and, and that's the key. The key is that we've always known that what we were doing wasn't enough. We've always known, but we didn't have the opportunity to participate in a model that is a cost, a cost reimbursement model. It's, it's, it's we're getting paid the cost as a CCBHC that it takes to get the outcomes that we're looking for. So now we've got this blanket. One of the key terms that you hear is open access. People talking open access, open access. There's not even a term for what this is that we're doing right now because this is this is unbridled access. This is people in the community once they have an episode. We're we're right now in the works of getting one of these mental health machines in the home of every single person that we serve. And so by the end of this year, by the end of this fiscal year, we'll be in a situation where 10,500 individuals in Northeastern, North Central Oklahoma will have instant access to 24 seven crisis stabilization, uh, relapse prevention services, and able to access their general service array from the comfort of their own home. This, I just want to jump in on this too. I just to underscore this point, um, you know, when you think about the usual care system, you know, I remember being in, in meetings a decade ago and, and meeting with law enforcement officials, and we were talking about the crisis intervention team, team model, which a lot of agencies across the country and the law enforcement side have, have, have implemented. And they were training their officers to, you know, respond well to people with uh, in behavioral crises, 
to uh, de-escalate those situations and try and connect them to services. But the problem they ran into over and over was once they tried to do that, they tried to take people to the mental health system and there was nowhere to take them. There was no place that had the capacity to do it. And the thing that is changing about CCBHCs is they have this funding model that allows them to not only help with these initial connections through these, these mental health machines that have been described today, but that there are mobile crisis services in the community where there's a CCBHC that can respond and that there are standards for access and timely access, access within three hours in those communities. And that means that there aren't police sitting in, or, you know, in uh, emergency rooms waiting for people to be admitted. And that also means that people aren't just being taken to jail because that's the easiest path forward. And so I, it really is enabled by the flexibility of the CCBHC model and the requirements in the certification criteria that makes, makes this change possible. So it, it really is, it's, it's a great illustration of a, a problem that's been plaguing our systems for, you know, decades. So uh, thanks for your work. I just uh, wanted to underscore that point. Thank you, David. And that concludes so our formal presentation on this. I, I, I love to ask uh, or answer questions uh, when that time comes, which I think it comes right now, but I'll let Brett officially <laughs> tell us where we're going from here. Well, I'll, uh, yes, I will make a formal transition to, uh, to Q and A. So if folks have questions, you know, please feel free to, to put them into the chat. Um, but one of the one of the things I I kind of wanted to to ask, and this is kind of my prefacing in the beginning of if I know some things that you know I might want to just ping you guys to talk a little bit about. So, um, so Josh and Alicia, dream big with me here, right? So the CTBC models um, able to embed you know evidence based practices that um, that that work is you know it's able to provide a Medicaid match for programs that have that are Medicaid eligible or being able to have Medicaid uh, reimburse it. Um, what are some things you're thinking about kind of taking this to the next level down the road? Um, what are some populations you're looking at? And, and obviously, you know, kind of uh, thinking through that lens of um, the broader justice systems, whether it be juvenile or beyond, um, where, where are you guys looking with your CCBHC? So I'm going to tell you, I'm really glad you asked that question. I feel like I, I would have emailed you to ask you to ask that if I'd have thought about it. We, uh, we're about to break ground on uh, a new one of a kind project right now. And so our, our outcome, because that's what we start with, just like I said, we started with an outcome of decreasing a uh, goal of decreasing inpatient hospitalization for adults. We want to decrease uh, youth being removed from their homes. We want to have an impact on that phenomenon. And what we want to see is we want to see less children being incarcerated, less adolescents being incarcerated. We want to see less adolescents and children being removed from their homes, going into inpatient uh, psychiatric residential hospitalization. And we want to reduce the number of kids being removed from their homes and going into DHS custody. And so what we're going to do, we're, we're breaking ground on this in one of our larger uh, service areas, one of our larger counties in the next two months. We're calling it a brief stay therapeutic home, and it's a it's a combination of a couple of different best practices. It's it's going to encompass some some wraparound type services, and it's going to encompass the um, oh, of course the the other the other model is going to elude me, but I'm going to explain the program because it'll come back to me once I start thinking about it here. And so what it, what it's going to be is it's going to be a house where traditionally. Families that have a, ch a child that goes into an inpatient situation, I want to talk about that population first. They, the, the inpatient treatment really is heavily focused on the kid. It's, it's focused kind of like, um, not purposefully, but there, there's a blame placed on the child as the catalyst for, for being removed. And I think that unfairly so, and, and, and we see the outcomes are, are kind of suffering because of this, there's not as much focus placed on the family Sometimes because the treatment facility is so far away, sometimes just because based on the model being used, the treatment model. But we know that if we can focus on that family unit and we can provide something that addresses that, that we're going to be able to treat the true source. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, this is going to be a, a single family dwelling that's going to be hardwired with audio and video equipment in just the common areas. And, and we're going to have a control room there at the house, it's going to be close to one of our clinics. But there's going to be 24 seven support and monitoring of this family coming into this unit and they're going to practice and they're going to learn and we're going to model and we're going to listen and we're going to coach and they're going to have a crash course in the child and the family learning to live together, cohabitate in a healthy manner 
and, and we're anticipating that we're going to be having families live in this home with us because it's going to be people that are at high risk of the child leaving the home. It's going to be people that are on the verge of the child going to residential treatment or on the verge of DHS removing the kids from the home. And we're going to keep them there for anywhere from 72 hours to a week is what we anticipate. But this is we, we kind of operate in a rapid change model. So we're not going to I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what this is going to look like. But what I do know is we're going to keep them in the communities where they live. We're going to keep them close to their support systems. We're going to keep them close to their schools, close to the parents' jobs. And we're going to not allow this isn't a place where kids are going to come and be supervised by us. We're not going to we're not going to treat at the kid. We are going to treat the family and we're going to uh, take that opportunity to uh, give them the skills they need. And, and then when they get done, they're going to leave with a, a mental health machine. They're going to leave with an iPad equipped with that MyCare application. So they have 24 seven support even after they leave. And so that's that's our that's our goal. Our goal is to decrease the impact of kids leaving um, their communities and being placed in places outside of their home, either incarceration inpatient hospitalization or foster care. And then we're gonna serve as a soft landing for those that have hit that higher level of care and are coming back in, the reintegration piece with their families uh, where they'll be living. So this this is, we anticipate it's gonna take about nine months to build this home because there's lots of the special specifications. Uh, we, we, ha we have some support from some local foundations. Uh, you know, lots of, lots of people like the ideas of things, especially when they don't have to do the work. So. We're prepared to uh, to do the work, and so in the in the coming years, we're going to be talking about. Here's the thing: if we never talk about it again, it didn't work, and if it does work, then you're going to hear a lot about it <laughs> because that's all we'll be talking about. But we anticipate we're going to see some similar outcomes with those populations. That that's great to hear. We we got a uh, question which I'm kind of interpreting a little bit more as a as a comment, but. Um, you know, as you plan this out, just, you know, kind of making sure that there's some representation for those interests of the youth uh, more broadly and creating those kind of partnerships, which I think the CCBHC model a lot for, right? Which, you know, ensures that those partnerships are there um, and able to provide both that cost sharing, some innovative um, collaboration. Um, but in addition to that comment, we got three specific questions um, and they might take a little bit of time. So uh, I'm going to cut down my next section because I think that these are really important. Um, the first question is around, um, I, I guess, kind of the um, uh, the the law enforcement's ability to kind of deem something a mental health condition or to deem something kind of relevant or, or where and how to direct someone. Can you give a little bit more context as to the agency that the law enforcement officer has in that and what what happens in the app and kind of where and how you're able to direct them? Uh, I think there's just uh, maybe a, a question or an, a, a, an insinuation that you know that law enforcement may be making clinical decisions. Oh, it's a very simple. So it's the opposite of that. It's it's anything. So all they have to think is, I need some backup on this. That's really the only thought that the law enforcement officer has to have is, I I'm going to check. So any time that there's a a chance that what they're seeing is a mental health condition, they so when they open when they open the iPad and it comes alive. There's, I said there's, there's two buttons now, but one of those buttons says crisis, and they hit that button, and someone live answers immediately. So there's, there's no times when it's not an immediate answering by someone who's able to help them. And see, they never have to hand the iPad off. If it's something that they're, if they just say, listen, this is what I'm, this is what I see right now. What are your thoughts? And then the, the licensed mental health professional can say, let me talk to the person. Licensed mental health professional can say. It appears that this person is beyond. It seem they seem a little too dangerous for us to take into our facility, right? Maybe if it's if we're we just had a, a certain kind of crime that takes place. Very rarely does that happen, but it's it's them not having to make those clinical judgments. The only judgment they have to have is something's not quite right. I could use some assistance here, and so it's twenty four hour. It's like they have it's it's like they have an entire treatment team sitting in their front seat because we have people we have licensed health professionals, peers nurse practitioners, all supervised by a board certified psychiatrist available to help them make that determination. So I, that's a really good question, but, and, and, and really, if I do the presentation right, I already say that. I already, I already would have said, this is to keep, keep law enforcement officers to be able to practice their expertise and let us be the experts in the mental health field and take the liability off of them. That's fantastic. Um, the other question as it relates to liability, uh, kind of using that, uh, using that term to just use, is around confidentiality and data sharing. 
Um, are there specific parameters either with this with this app or with data sharing within other areas, right? Um, thinking of the sequential intercept model, um, where you have to be very thoughtful about kind of what you're sharing, how you're sharing it, what permissions do you need from the individual in an in effort to do that? Could you share a little bit more uh, about uh, data sharing? So for for your audience now, um, it's the app is HIPAA compliant. So if we're talking technology, I don't think that's the question though, but that is something that we always have to mention and that we work really hard to make sure the app um, meet, meets uh, specific HIPAA compliance regulations. With us, uh, we just, we kind of operate, we don't take people that have current charges pending. So this is gonna be in lieu of charges. So there's there's no need for us to be able to, they have to be OR'd out for us to accept them anyway into our units because when, unless we're talking about the specific EDO process where those, those the, they're very well defined, the communications that take place between us and the court system. But once law enforcement drops someone off with us, it is never going to be a situation where they're going to then go back to law enforcement as a matter of, as a matter of that transaction. So, so it's, if that's the question, I think the question is, if we're doing data sharing with law enforcement to to talk to them about certain things, if there's not an emergency detention order that's a, that's a court ordered type treatment taking place, once the law enforcement officer drops the person off with us, that concludes the amount of information that we're giving them at this time. It could come up that that's not acceptable for some people. I understand for us right now, um, it's working. No, that that is great. I'll I'll hold the last question to our our final piece of it because actually I think I'm gonna be able to answer it in our next section. Um, but you know please you know correct me um, with your uh, with your work on 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 uh, as the CCBHC you know when we get to our Q and A section. Um, but thank you, Josh and Alicia, so much not just for your time in sharing uh, what you've been able to do, uh, but for the work you do generally every day, um, saving lives and thinking innovatively about how we can improve our system. Uh, through the CCBHC model. Really grateful for that. Thanks, Brett. Thank you. So I'll so I'll, I'll talk a little bit here. I'm just kind of echoing a bit of what uh, David talked about in the beginning, but I, I want to kind of underscore a few things for those who are participants here, um, because I want to underscore where there's opportunities for you to be engaged within this. So the CCBHC criteria, as David kind of walked through, kind of there's two components here that I think are really relevant and, and uh, um, and important, the, the scopes of services and then care coordination, because um, those are both areas, whether you are a health provider um, within the scopes of services, or um, you are a part of law enforcement or a kind of quasi law enforcement, quasi health kind of entity uh, that's doing some of those connectivity services between those two systems. Um, so an interesting component and in kind of what differs the CCBC model from other uh, types of healthcare systems, and just wanted to touch on this, is that the state has that authority when it comes to certifying um, different facilities. Um, as uh, relates to other models, there's a lot more ownership happening in DC and the federal government, um, but here with this model, right, so the federal government's kind of created this floor, provides a lot of support um, that the states are able to certify, uh, and, and nonprofits, government entities, um, or tribal institutions are able to uh, become and establish uh, CCBHC. Um, now, the, the scopes of service piece of this, I think, is really important and really relevant, um, right? So the ones that are in blue here are ones that must be provided inside the CCBHC. Um, as uh, David mentioned, crisis services, if there's already established model um, within your state, you know, that could be a part of it. The ones here that are in green are ones that can be delivered outside of uh, the CCBHC. So if you're, in, if you're an organization that provides peer support, whether that's peer support for mental health services, for substance use services, for both, um, you can be embedded in the CCBHC and have a financial relationship where, uh, and that's, uh, that relationship is called a designated collaborating organization. Um, that's where you're going to be able to create a partnership, um, have some financial um, support. You're really brought into the umbrella, you're under the umbrella of a CCBHC. Um, and that's a means by which you're able to both strengthen the number of uh, individuals you're able to serve, your financial supports, um, as well as getting some clearer and better information about the people and populations that you're serving. Um, of course, also, if you are uh, a, a primary care institution, like an FQHC, um, or if you're an institution that's providing um, uh, specific services that are, that are 
require, but maybe a dish out of scope, like an OTP, like methadone, um, you'll still be able to create this kind of DCO collaborative organ collaborative partnership um, in order to uh, be a part of the CCBC and again, sharing in that financial support, et cetera. Veterans, of course, is another one as well. But I wanted to kind of echo or underscore that component of this because, you know, we often talk to organizations, institutions, et cetera, and they're like, well, how do I kind of join this effort? What are, what are some things that I can do uh, to ensure that we're a uh, part of that? Um, I'll, when um, we go to the q and I'll, I'll plug in the current um, list of CCBHCs uh, across the country. We also have a locator map that we'll be updating shortly uh, to reflect the recent July grantees that uh, were awarded. Um, but have those conversations with your CCBHC. Ensure that they know the great work that you are doing and the ways that you're able to work and figure out if it's a care coordination effort where you're able to create uh, you know, a more informal or formal partnership or make sure that you're, um, if you're wanting to make that formal partnership, uh, you know, look to see how that could be established and being part of that um, uh, umbrella there. So um, CCBHCs are innovating all the time, um, as Josh just mentioned, with some uh, new um, innovative elements that they're looking at, uh, kind of looking at youth. Um, so if you're doing that innovative work, you've got great information, you've got great data, um, make sure you can kind of share in that. Um, because in the event that uh, any funding shifts, whether it be from a line item um, within a within a, a state's budget, within a county's budget, um, or grants shift in their scope, uh, or what have you, you know, this is a means to ensure that you have some sustainable supports there. Um, speaking of sustainable supports, I'll talk a little bit about some of the funding components. So uh, quickly, there are a few different things I want to just kind of talk about from the funding component. So the Excellence in Mental Health and Addiction Act Treatment Act. Uh, of 2021 is a policy that's currently being discussed in Congress. Um, should that policy be passed, um, it would allow states, and again, states are the ones that certify clinics to be a part of this, to join in that demonstration. So be a part of those kind of eight, um, now 10 states that were allowed into the, uh, into the demonstration. Um, Congress also extended that demonstration to 2023. Um, it's providing additional funding for CCBHCs as grantees. Um, and as we talked about before, sometimes the, um, those funding opportunity announcements will come. Um, and if uh, states align with um, the, the grant requirements, um, there will hopefully be you know, some, some more grantees being announced, um, which may align with some of the things that you are all doing. Um, now, when it comes to permanency, there are two paths that a state can have. Oklahoma is one of those states that, that move forward with this. Um, it's either a state plan amendment, so changing its plan to include CCBHCs as a Medicaid provider type, so making this model, making this healthcare delivery system a part of the state's, uh, state's plan, a part of the state's system, um, or it can do that through a Medicaid waiver. The difference between a SPA, a state plan or a waiver, uh, for those of you who may not be uh, health wonks like me, um, is that the, the Medicaid waiver is for a shorter period of time, doesn't have to be statewide, um, and it needs to be budget neutral. The state plan amendment um, doesn't have to have all of those requirements around it. Um, so uh, some, some opportunities there. Uh, when it comes to kind of what we're seeing across the country in states, so right now, 42 states, um, the District of Columbia and Guam, um, all have CCBHCs either as a formalized part of their plan, part of being a demonstration, or have grantees. Um, now, what's really innovative and what's, what's kind of cool that we're seeing um, from, uh, some, from some states is that there are states looking at Illinois and Kansas who have um, seen this model, seen what it's been able to do for their, their demonstration partners, and established the model and, and passed legislation to establish the model um, as part of their plan, whether that be through an 1115 waiver or through a SPA. Um, you know, where that kind of goes, how those partnerships might be created, and what different criteria the states may identify um, in addition to the baseline criteria is going to be um, you know, a really neat opportunity to kind of see what we're seeing there. Um, there are other states who are having some discussions along those lines to see how sustainability might, uh, it's, it's to see what paths for sustainability might be possible there. Um, so it's a, it's a keen opportunity if you are uh, in a uh, area, jurisdiction, in a state where there are CCBHCs um, and you're wanting to create some partnerships or at least wanting to let them know what you're doing and hear more about what they're doing, so that obviously things aren't duplicative or so that uh, you're able to have that cost sharing, um, that will be really important to do. 
Um, there's a number of elements for state funding. I'll just flag really quickly in addition to those block grants, um, states can use, or in addition to the expansion grants, sorry, uh, states can use their mental health block grants to provide some of, that, some of that support to have their clinics ready and have that technical assistance. Um, and now we'll go to the larger Q&A, and I think we're pretty uh, pretty good on, on time. Is that correct, Demetrius? Yep, we're pretty good on time. Um, again, I just want to remind folks that for this larger Q&A, this will be your opportunity to ask questions not only to the GLMHC panelists, but also to Brett and his presentation around what the National Council is doing, as well as to David and what they were presented around what SAMHSA is doing. Um, again, we will respond to as many questions as time permits. And I also just want to give you all a reminder that if you could please chat your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom right hand corner of, of your screen. Um, so happy to now begin with the Q&A questions. And I, and I just want to, if I could jump in really quick and just back to the questions we had in the last section, I just want to touch on something that came up real briefly. Um, you know, there was a concern about kind of liability and who's making decisions about who should go where. And I do think this is an extra resource for law enforcement to have someone who's a mental health professional to kind of figure out what's happening with an individual in question who's experiencing a crisis. And so I don't think it's a bad thing. And so you may think of this as, um, you know, oh, we might have faced liability, but think of all the people who end up with, um, uh, in, with mental illnesses who end up in jails and prisons. And there's a huge amount of liability when that happens too. And so it's not like the alternative scenario is that it's there, there aren't existing problems. The other thing I would say is that think about the experience of the people with mental illness as well. You know, uh, to be taken to an emergency room, well, you're in a state of crisis, you're not getting the services you need, and you're sitting in a very busy and stressful place for hours waiting for care that you don't know if you're going to get. That's one scenario. And the other scenario is to go to jail. You know, I just feel like this is a win-win. You know, it saves, it uses services more efficiently. Um, and, uh, you know, it provides an opportunity for better care. And the other thing is, you know, there's liability in the, the, in the, in the other scenario that exists right now. So don't forget that. Thanks. I think, I think we have a, a similar question that I think kind of sort of gets to the liability question. I'll, I'll let any of you respond to this one. But the question specifically was, how do you address situations with a person involved may need um, to be medically de um, de detoxed. Yeah, so as a as a CCBHC, there's certain requirements for those crisis centers that we have uh, open. So we do certain levels of detoxification. We, we do uh, ambulatory withdrawal management. And so once once somebody hits a level beyond that, when they do need to be medically detoxed, we have relationships with local uh, hospitals. We purpose we purposefully uh, construct these facilities in uh, close proximity to regional medical centers, and that way we're able to utilize those regional regional medical centers to be able to provide that detoxification service. And what you'll notice in this model that's a little different is we're we're shouldering a lot more. We know we know transportation is a big is a big deal right now nationally when it comes to law enforcement uh, not wanting to be looked at as a as a transportation service. And what you'll notice is with CCBHCs in the model that we're utilizing, we're shouldering a lot more of that um, burden to get people to and from locations. As long as they're not in law enforcement custody, where there's there's lots of things that we can do to be able to get people to and from things that they need, even while we're still treating that crisis. And so for this type of situation, and also like when we take them home. So we came up, I was in a meeting earlier today, and when we take People come to our crisis centers from a variety of areas because I told you we only have three. So that means only there's nine counties that don't have one that people are coming to us from those from those counties. Well, they've got to get home. Right. And traditionally, somebody would be calling law enforcement and saying, hey, we got somebody needs to go home uh, when you come to get them. And, and that's that's not what we do. So it's the same kind of idea. Once law enforcement um, makes that handoff to us in these crisis centers, we handle the other needs that are that are there. So we, we will get people home. We will get people to detox and then resume their crisis treatment upon them being stabilized. Um, I think that answers the question. So we, we do have some 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 kind of follow up, very specific questions to your programs, Josh, but I'm going to give you a break to breathe and ask um, Alicia a question specifically around um, 
the, the eligibility requirements around the specialty court program that you discussed and wanted to know whether you had any success rates around that program. As far as around the pretrial release program? Yes. Okay, so yes, um, our eligibility requirements really are, um, there's two different types of individuals specifically when we look at pretrial release. We're looking at individuals who are basically, they, they may have some case management needs. They, they qualify for our services, so they have a diagnosis of either, you know, mental health or substance use, but they have some sort of needs as far as like unable to obtain uh, employment or housing or any issues like that. And so we are able to get them in our pretrial program based on that. Uh, but then the other are those that have the severe mental illness, you know, that are showing those uh, increased needs in the jail. And so with those individuals, those are higher needs individuals that, you know, have, may have more serious diagnosis. Um, and so in those instances, we receive those referrals from the jail. Our uh, licensed behavioral staff will see them beforehand um, and then determine kind of a plan of care to discuss with the judge. And so um, when it comes to the success rate, we monitor it as a whole, uh, which is the 35% success rate. And so those are individuals, the success rate is measuring those who have been from the time that they were released from jail to the time that they are, uh, their case is disposed of. And so they didn't go AWOL, they didn't, you know, abscond anywhere. They, um, you know, kept checking in with us. They kept checking in with treatment. Uh, and with their lawyers and everything. So at the 35%, while that is much lower, um, it is one that is very seen as successful considering there's a lot of pretrial programs out there that um, do not see that high of a success rate. And I think that speaks to the amount of services that we're able to provide within the CCBHC and the amount of services that we're able to, you know, just kind of check in with the courts as a whole. And Alicia, just to so, kind of um, add one quick kind of component to it, are there uh, also, you know, for some of the, the the components who aren't part part of that success rate, is that due in part to some of the technical violations that might happen with folks, right? So, and those may vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction or by you know the the person you know within that law enforcement space or state by state. Um, so you know, out, out there, not the, the breaking of the law or, you know, some of the other things that we might not look at um, with uh, with healthcare. But do, do you want to, can you just add a little bit more context there? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So those who are not successful, it could be based on a technical error, but most of the time it is because they have stopped reporting, um, you know, to us and to the court. And so that is when we discuss with the judge and then their PR bond is revoked at that point. Thank you. I'm going to quick. Um, I'm going to kick this question to either David or Brett. Um, Brett, I know you brought up a side earlier, just discussing the distribution of CCBHC. Someone had a specific question. Housing is usually usually the biggest barrier for the justice involved population. How I may have um, so editorializing, but but do the CCBHC staff sit on or with homeless continuum of care teams? to make sure individuals are appropriately housed in addition to receiving supportive services. So just can you speak to a bit, if you know about the CCBHC breakdown, who may be dealing with re-entry and uh, particularly um, homeless, homelessness? I can jump in here real quick. And, and uh, Brett, if you want to fill in around the edges, I'd appreciate it. So uh, the, the certification criteria that really set the framework for what the floor is that CCBHCs have, have to provide don't specifically say that CCBHCs have to provide those supports. But uh, what we're finding is that a lot of CCBHCs are doing work in housing, and they're enabled to do that by the extra, extra resources they're receiving as a part of participating in the CCBHC programs, whether that's the SAMHSA expansion grants or the prospective payment systems. And uh, through the prospective payment systems, it provides a lot of flexibility that isn't seen in other funding sources. And so um, those types of housing related supports is not housing itself, but the kinds of supportive services that could be put in place to help people get connected to housing can be provided through the CCBHC model and in kind of coordination with other systems like the criminal justice system. So it's something that, you know, we're seeing a lot of CCBHCs. It's not required in every single CCBHC, but it's, it's definitely something that can be provided through the model. I think that's a really important point. So 
appreciate the uh, person who raised that raising it. So. Yeah, did you have anything to add? Only to, to echo too that so because the CCBHC can have its staff outside of the four walls of the clinic, that can be you know in partnership with those um, with those uh, kind of housing coordinating spaces, right? Um, there's also a number of clinics that I've talked to where the staff is embedded into food pantries, right? So individuals who may be needing access to food to other services, they're there to say, can we also help you with something else, right? And be able to connect them to those services. So. Um, you know, a lot of opportunity for innovation. So whatever's working well, whatever exists, the CCBHC can be embedded in there to meet those services. And the other thing is, I just I keep on coming back to the needs assessment because I think it's really important. But you know, this whole <laughs> process starts with an assessment of community needs, and that that process should identify housing needs as being some of those needs. And so that you know, if this is properly impl properly implemented, it should pick up that piece and provide a response to it. So. Thank you. I want to be respectful of people's time. It's it's now 401. I ask if you can stay on for just another five or so minutes. I want to return to the one specific question, Josh, that folks had about your specific program. And then two more minutes just to close out with the three remaining um, slides that we have. Um, someone wrote, thank you, Josh. Hearing about your app and how you were able to um, get total buy-in from the PD was fascinating. What were the two the two levels of care you added to your services again? Um, and then the second question was really again a question about the program specifically about the iPads, the internet service, and the connectivity. Does the patient keep the iPad or or, or do they get returned? Um, and who provides the internet service? Has it has this issue come up? And how has this been funded? You said how many minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get started. How, many, start. how many do you need? <laughs> okay, so I just do. I'm going to take the second question first because it's all related. And I think it's if I start telling you, that was the biggest consideration we had as we started putting those machines into rural Oklahoma was that we had to use multiple uh, service providers to be able to get reliable service. And we truly were going to every little nook and cranny of that. Uh, 10,000 square mile area trying to figure out because the only thing worse than somebody thinking that they have a safety net law enforcement officers or um, people we serve is that they think they have it and when they hit the button for the first time it doesn't work because they'll never use it again it's 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 like a brick uh, we provide the machines to them we recoup those machines at the end of treatment so when law enforcement officers we don't have to recoup them from them because it's an ongoing relationship we just continue to uh, upgrade the machines and upgrade the the versions as necessary for um and we and we provide we provide the uh unlimited data that goes with those and remember they're locked down we learned early on because we didn't have them locked down we tried to and um we learned through the process how we had to go into single app mode because we had a client that streamed netflix or something all weekend and we had a joint data plan we so we employ 1100 people we had some joint data plan. Well, no, <laughs> one person used all the data somehow. We came to work on Monday and nobody had data except for the guy that streamed all the Netflix. So we had to learn how to lock that down. We, we have since, so this is really cool, okay? We've developed a relationship with AT&T. We met with AT&T corporate for about a year to get designated as a first responder, okay? A mental health first responder. And with that designation, we gained access to their first net services first net's usually reserved for first responders to to uh you know so when they respond to uh, emergencies healthcare emergencies or uh you know natural disasters things of that nature and we got that designation and so that first net service it jumps from tower to tower service to service they partner with other providers and so the likelihood that you're going to lose connectivity is is much much decreased through that relationship so that's how that's how it evolved uh, and then the last part was we do try to recoup those devices. There's a loss. There's a lot in our budget. There's a, there's a certain number that we're not going to be able to get because people break them. They get bed bugs. And once, I mean, bed bugs can get into iPads. We've determined and once, a, once they get in there, you can't get them out. Uh, there's just certain things that were, that we, that we, that we lose iPads, but we're losing them at a rate of about less than 5%, which is pretty good because people utilize them. You know, they have them for a long period of time, sometimes over two years before they before the uh, technology gets obsolete and then you got to remind me the first question again because I you're muted
I'm sorry, I'm on mute. It always happens. What was the two um what were okay. the two levels of care you added to your services? So we added a psychiatric urgent care level, which in Oklahoma now we can accept people that have um, been detained for and for up to 24 hours. We can uh, set with 23 hours and 59 minutes. We can do an assessment to determine the appropriate level of care, which may be a step up, maybe a step down. So, so we have that in all three locations, our psychiatric urgent cares to allow us that piece of, uh, and then we, we have another structured crisis center, which is a five, a five bed unit. And that uh, allows us to hold someone with uh, with an emergency detention order for up to five days. So it's still a lower level of care than that psychiatric urgent care. I mean, than that um, inpatient hospitalization. And what it allows us to do is um, work within all three of those. And we're showing that through that that, that five beds, mo many people think the answer to this problem of psychiatric treatment is more beds. And, and this is a controversial statement, but I can't help but make it is if you have beds, you have to keep the beds full in order to pay for the beds. And so for us right now, I told you that population, 500,000 people, 480,000 people, 10,000 square miles, five beds. That's what we're using to, uh, to meet the psychiatric um, crisis needs right now because of those urgent cares, because of these mental health machines. Thanks. And again, I just want to be respectful of folks time. Um, so we're going to move on, but if you stay on for just a few minutes, you will see that our panelists, as well as our speakers offered their specific contact information. So if you have any lingering questions, you can, you can take their information and you can specifically ask them. Um, so next slide. As mentioned, next slide. Yes. So, as mentioned earlier, I want to encourage you all to register and attend CSG's Justice Center National Conference taking the call. Um, communities across the U.S. are launching new responses to emergency calls. They are redefining who answers calls for service involving mental health or substance use crisis, homelessness, quality of life issues, and other low-level situations. We, along with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice, and the University of Cincinnati, will be presenting a two-day virtual conference for interested teens and individuals um, on October 20th through the 21st on 2021. Taking the call is the National Conference Exploring Innovative Community Responder Models, and will bring together from across the U.S. to explore how jurisdictions are building comprehensive crisis systems that ensure that emergency calls receive appropriate responses. Sessions will explore the opportunities and challenge, challenges in rethinking response to emergency calls through strategies such as community, community responder models, will help professionals respond to 911 calls, and police mental health collaborations. We encourage you to register for this free event, either as an individual or as a team who are working together to implement a community responder program. You can register through the, through the CSG Justice Center's event page or by clicking the link that I am about to drop. Um, next slide. Also, as mentioned before, the panelists as well as the speakers have graciously offered their contact information. So if you have any follow up questions, um, feel free to reach out to them. Next slide. Again, and if you haven't done so already, we're, we're really, we really want to encourage you to join the CSU Justice Center newsletter listserv. Not only is it a great way to learn about funding opportunities such as the JMHCP grant, but you will also receive information on upcoming trainings and resources from our agency and um, other external partners. I also like to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and will be posted along with this, this slide deck on the CSG Justice Center's um, event website page. Um, okay, I want to thank everyone, our panelists, especially our presenters especially, and to everyone who attended. Thanks everyone for joining our webinar and have a great rest of your day.